If you have your Bibles, I invite your attention to Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, which will be the primary text for today's message. But before that, I'm going to read for you Psalm 90, verse 20, which inspired the title of the sermon. Psalm 90, verse 12, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And then from Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, Therefore, since we have been justified through, peace, through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our suffering because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Let us pray. And now, O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Donald McCullough references in an article some of the actions and comments of famous, famous people who were dealing with the sting of disappointment. Alexander the Great, having conquered Persia, broke down and wept bitterly because his troops were too exhausted to push on into India. John Quincy Adams, the sixth president of the United States, wrote in his diary, my life has been spent in vain and idle aspirations and in ceaseless rejected prayers that something would be the result of my existence that was beneficial to my species. And Robert Louis Stevenson, the author of many great works of literature, wrote these words for his tombstone. Here lies one who meant well, who tried little, and who failed much. I know that many of us have felt the sting of disappointment. You had high hopes for a happy marriage, but those hopes were demolished by divorce. You had expectations of finding a well-paying career after earning your college degree, but you've been stuck in a dead-end job that's unrelated to your education and ambitions. You anticipated retiring early and having a fun-filled retirement of travel and excitement and adventure, but ill health hindered your dreams. You've experienced disappointment, haven't you? Maybe you identify with Chippy. She was a pet parakeet referenced in Max Licato's book, The Eye of the Storm. One day, Chippy's owner was cleaning the bird's cage using a vacuum cleaner. She had done it this way many times before. The bird was in the cage, but it had never been a problem. Everything was going well until the phone rang. Turning to pick up the phone, the vacuum cleaner quickly sucked up poor little Chippy. When the lady realized what had happened, she immediately turned off the vacuum cleaner. She opened up the contraption to find her loving pet digging through the dirt. Surprised, she covered the little bird with her hand, seeing that he was still alive. But being covered with all the dirt, she immediately ran to the sink, turned on the cold water, and began to rinse off the fella. After a moment or two, Chippy was clean, but there was another problem. The tiny parakeet was now shivering from all of the cold water. So she ran to the bathroom and grabbed the hairdryer, giving Chippy several doses of hot air to dry off and warm up. Somehow the events of Chippy's ordeal were communicated to a local newspaper who just had to send a reporter out to interview the woman about what had happened with her little bird. 
The interviewer said, has anything changed about Chippy since the events of that day? And she replied, well, Chippy doesn't seem as happy as he once did. Before he would sing all through the day. Now he just sits in one spot in the cage and stares at me. Sometimes I feel like that little bird. I feel shell-shocked by the events of my life. It feels like the events of life has sucked me up, washed me over, and blown me away. You probably understand that feeling. The days of our lives are accentuated by disappointments, by challenges. And you know that. I'm going to illustrate it for you. I'm going to mention certain dates in history. And you tell me what tragic event happened, what disappointing event happened on that day. What happened on December 7th, 1941? Let me get the whole date out first, Bootsy. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You're fine. I know, yeah. You probably know all of these. What happened on November 22nd? 1963, assassination of Kennedy. What happened on September 11th, 2001? I'll bet there are days like that in your own history. You've lost a parent or a spouse or a sibling, a child, and that date is marked in your mind for the rest of your lives. The month and the date is on the calendar, a constant reminder of life's disappointments. The psalmist says, teach us to number our days. But when he wrote that, I don't think he was advising us to mark up our calendar with all of life's tragedies. If you live long enough, you might have all of those dates covered. Nor do I think he was advising us simply to place a mark over each date on the calendar as it draws to a close. That's the way Tom Hanks did it in the movie Castaway. Each evening for four years, he was marking a little mark on a calendar or on a, on a wall to say that it had been one more day that he had been deserted on that island. But I don't think that the psalmist is inviting us to mark each of the days on our calendar as they draw to a close. So what does he mean? Listen as I read that verse from Psalms one more time, but from a more contemporary translation. He says, teach us to make the most of our time. Teach us to make the most of our time so that we might grow in wisdom. That's what he means. It means make the most of every day. Make the most of every moment. Make the most of our time. It means that no matter how brief and sorrow prone our lives may be, we should make the most of each one. We should aim to live each day to its fullest. We should live each moment aware of God's love and grace. We should live with the awareness that each moment of our lives count for something. Teach us to make the most of our time that we might grow in wisdom. Good advice. So how do we start living that way? You've probably heard the phrase, today is the first day of the rest of your life. Live like today is the first day of the rest of your life. Learn to live with the spirit of that Latin phrase, carpe diem. Seize the day. Grab hold of each new day. Go for the gusto. Live out loud. We don't know when our last day would come. So make the most of every day. A family circus comic strip has a classic caption. Yesterday is the past. Tomorrow is the future. Today is a gift. That's why we call it the present. Unfortunately for many of us, the present left, is left unwrapped. So here's the psalmist advice. Pounce on every moment of every day. Unwrap the present moment knowing that it is a gift from God. Learn how to number your days. 
so that you may gain a heart of wisdom and live each day as though it is a gift from the Lord because it is. The psalmist speaks of wisdom. The wisdom of numbering our days. He teaches us to take each new day as a gift, no matter how riddled it may be at any moment with disappointments. Wisdom teaches us to remember that there is one who is the source of every day. Wisdom teaches us to be proactive and purposeful. Wisdom teaches us not to waste our time. Wisdom teaches us that time is a sacred gift from God. Wisdom teaches us to measure and savor each day. Ann Dillard once said, spend the afternoon. You can't take it with you. Excellent advice for morning, noon, and afternoon. So how do we spend the afternoon? How do we remember our days in such a way that they bring glory to God? I think a little bit of that is behind Paul's writing in Romans 5. He speaks of the divine grace that justifies us before God. In God's eyes, we need to know that we are not broken. We are not sinful, despicable creatures. We are people by God's grace who have been completed, who have been fully accepted, who are dearly loved, who are justified before God. That's how God sees you. That's what Paul is saying. When he uses that word justification, it refers to the action of God at removing the darkness of sin's dominion over our lives. When God looks at you, God declares that you are right. God declares that you are forgiven and shown mercy and given grace. God declares that we are liked, loved, accepted, included, and adopted. Now when we realize that all of this is a grace that God has credited to our lives, we discover that coming with it are all of the divine blessings of grace. And the Paul mentions one. He says that we are at peace with God. Not because of what we've done, but because of who God is. Right now, you are at peace with God. If you spend your day trying to justify your existence before God, you'll be miserable. If you feel each day that you have to earn your keep and earn God's favor, you will feel miserable. If you spend your day trying to attain a certain standard of righteous behavior, you will be miserable. The Christian life is not meant to be that struggle, that misery, that guilt. It's meant to be joyful, gracious, and gratitude-filled, awareness of our inclusion, our gift of grace from God, the peace that we share with God. If you are trying to justify yourself, you will never feel at peace with God because there's nothing we can ever do that would be enough. You can't earn your keep. You can't obtain righteousness by your behaviors. You can never make peace with God. The more you try, the more miserable you be. But you can receive the gift of peace that comes from God by grace. Justification is a gift of God. It is a gift that can be experienced by faith, the byproduct of which is realizing that we are always right, we are always connected, we are always in relationship, we are always dearly loved, we are always at peace with God. Now I know that there are several of you who are finding hard to accept that peace right now. You feel that you, that we have failed God. And I understand that emotion. I've heard the conversations. Well, we've just not done enough. We're not committed enough. We've failed God. Let me respond as clearly as I can on a Sunday morning from the pulpit. That sort of thinking is pure, unadulterated baloney. If there's another word you'd rather put in there, you do that in the privacy of your own thoughts. 
God does not want us to spend our last two months as a congregation feeling grief or guilt or inadequacy. God wants us to feel confident in his love and grace for us. God wants us to celebrate the assurance that we are at peace with God. God wants us to know that his grace has gifted us with justification. Listen, God has been faithful through you in this place for many, many years. God was faithful through Parkview Baptist. God was faithful through Calvary Baptist. God is faithful through Patterson Avenue Baptist. The only thing that has eternal significance, the only thing that really matters is that God has been faithful through us. God has been faithful through us. And because of God's faithfulness, because of what God has done in this place through us, lives have been changed, people have been transformed, families have been blessed, ministry has been done, the message of grace has been declared. And from this day forward, whenever we gather as a congregation, we need to celebrate God's grace. And when we pronounce our final benediction as a congregation, we should celebrate that God's work will continue in this place, in this location, for decades and decades to come. In this place, converts will be baptized, babies will be dedicated, teenagers will hear the call to ministry, broken families will be healed, the Bible will be taught, missions will be done, ministry will be conducted, all because of your faith in God's grace, which we expressed last week following worship. Since the word of our vote was made public, I've received nonstop calls, texts, letters, emails, contacts via social media from denominational leaders, from missionaries in foreign countries, from believers literally around the world, all commending this congregation for its faithful act of generosity. But what really got to me were the friends who are non-believers. One of them sent me a note when a church is willing to give itself away like yours did, it makes me think that there might be something to what they're saying. Your congregation and its act represents the best of what Christianity has to offer. That a word from an atheistic Jewish person who's a friend of mine. So here's the challenge. When we gather, we praise God. We express our confidence in God. We celebrate God's grace and peace, which is ours through Jesus Christ. We remember that our account individually and as a congregation is fully justified. We remember that we are set free. Here's the message from today's scripture lesson. Remember it every day. Paul wrote it. God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. God's love has been poured out in your life through Jesus Christ in the presence of the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Your life is whole, complete, blessed, and you, we, we are eternally at peace with God. Let us pray. God, it is your grace.